Good morning. I'm Sarah, survivor, author, coach, and speaker. Sometimes, once in a while. I teach women how to better relationships, after abuse, and how to get safe, stable, and strong. Welcome to my Jesus bubble. Let's share a quiet moment. That's good for your soul. One of the things I like to do in the morning is spend quiet time with God, praying, thinking, journaling. And every now and then, I do it here so that you can join me and have a quiet moment too. Right now, we've been reading together through the book, Hind's Feet on High Places. And I happen to love this beautiful illustrated version. And this book is a, it's a, it's an allegory. It's a story that means so much more. And the heroine in our book is named Much Afraid. She has recently had the seed of love planted in her heart. She is ready to follow the chief shepherd to the high places. And this is episode four. So if you have been following along, this week, well, it's early in the morning. If you've been following along every morning, then you already know what's going on. But if not, feel free to catch up in the playlist to make sure that you know what's going on in our story. One of the reasons that I love this book so much is because it deals directly with how to navigate fear and suffering. And those are two really, really big issues in my wild community here. All of us have experienced fear and suffering in some way. And you know what? We all need help in navigating it and learning to heal from it. So let's read. There was one moment indeed, this is the last paragraph from yesterday. There was one moment indeed when the song first started and everyone was startled into silence. When she might have called to the shepherd to come and help her. She did not realize that the fearings who had invaded her house were holding their breath lest she did call to the shepherd, and had she done so, they would have fled helter-skelter through the door. However, she was too stunned with fear to seize the opportunity, and then it was too late. The next moment, she felt Coward's heavy hand laid tightly over her mouth, and then other hands gripped her firmly and held her in the chair, so the shepherd slowly passed the cottage showing himself at the window, and singing the signal song, but receiving no response of any kind. When he had passed, and the words of the song and the bleating of the sheep had died away in the distance, it was found that Much Afraid had fainted. Her cousin Coward's hands had half-choked her. Her relatives would dearly have liked to seize this opportunity and carry her off while she could not run away. But... As this was the hour when everybody was returning from work, it was too dangerous. The fearings decided, therefore, that they would remain in the cottage until darkness fell, and then carry her off unperceived. When this plan had been decided upon, they laid her on the bed to recover as best she might, while some of the aunts and the cousins went out into the kitchen to see what provisions for refreshing themselves might be plundered. The men sat smoking in the sitting-room, and gloomy, her cousin, was left to guard the half-conscious victim in the bedroom. Gradually, much afraid, regained her senses, and as she realized her position, she nearly fainted again in fear. She dared not cry out for help, for all her neighbors would be away at their work. But were they? No, it was later than she had thought, for suddenly she heard the voice of Mrs. Valiant, her neighbor in the cottage next door. At the sound, much afraid, braced herself for one last desperate bid for escape. Gloomy was quite unprepared for such a move, and before she realized what was happening, Much Afraid sprang from the bed, shouted through the window as loudly as her fear permitted, Valiant! Valiant! Come and help me! Come quickly! Help! At the sound of her first cry, Mrs. Valiant looked across the garden and caught a glimpse of Much Afraid's white, terrified face at the window, and of her hand beckoning entreatingly. The next moment, the face was jerked away from view, and a curtain suddenly drawn across the window. That was enough for Mrs. Valiant, whose name described her exactly. 
She hurried straight across to her neighbor's cottage and tried the door, but finding it locked, she looked in through a window and saw the room full of Much Afraid's relatives, the Fearings. Mrs. Valiant was not the sort of person to be the least intimidated by what she called a pack of idle fears. Thrusting her face right in the window, she cried in a threatening voice, "'Out of this house this you go this minute, every one of you. If you have not left in three seconds, I shall call the chief shepherd. This cottage belongs to him, and won't you catch it if he finds you here?' The effect of her words was magical. The door was unbolted and thrown open, and the fearings poured out pell-mell, tumbling over one another in their haste to get away. Mrs. Valiant smiled grimly as she watched their ignominious flight. Excuse me. When the last one had scuttled away, she went into the cottage to Much Afraid, who seemed quite overcome with fear and distress. Little by little, she learned the story of those hours of torment and the plan to kidnap the poor victim. After darkness fell, Mrs. Valiant hardly knew herself what it was to feel fear, and had just routed the whole gang of fearing single-handed. She felt inclined to adopt a bracing attitude, and to chide the silly girl for not standing up to her relatives at once, boldly repulsing them before they got her into their clutches. But as she looked at the white face and the terrified eyes, and saw the quaking body of poor much afraid, she checked herself. What is the use of saying it? She thought. She can't act upon it, poor thing. She's one of them herself, and has got fearing in the blood. And when the enemy is within, it's a poor prospect. I think no one but the shepherd himself can really help her, she reflected. So instead of giving an admonition, she patted the trembling girl and said with all the kindness of her motherly heart, Now, my dear, while you are getting over your fright, I'll just pop into the kitchen and make a good cup of tea for both of us, and you'll feel better at once. My, if they haven't been in here and put the kettle on for us, she added, as she opened the door and found the cloth already on the table, and the preparations for the plundered meal which the unwanted visitors had so hastily abandoned. What a pack of harpies, she muttered angrily to herself, and then smiled complacently as she remembered how they had fled before her. By the time they had drunk their tea, and Mrs. Valiant had energetically cleared away the last traces of unwelcome invaders, Much Afraid had nearly recovered her composure. Darkness had long since fallen, and now it was much too late for her to go to the pool to keep tryst with the shepherd and explain why she had not responded to his call. She would have to wait for the morning light. So at Mrs. Valiant's suggestion, as she was feeling utterly exhausted, she went straight to bed. Her neighbor saw her safely tucked in, kissed her warmly and reassuringly. Indeed, she offered to sleep in the cottage herself that night. But much afraid, knowing she had a family waiting for her at home, refused the kind offer. However, before leaving, Mrs. Valiant placed a bell beside her bed and assured her that if anything alarmed her in the night, she had only to ring the bell, and the whole Valiant family would be over instantly to assist her. Then she went away and much afraid was left alone in the cottage. For hours, poor much afraid, lay sleepless on her bed, too bruised in mind and body to rest in one position, but tossing and turning wearily from side to side until long after midnight. Somewhere at the back of her mind was a dreadful uneasiness, as though there was something she ought to remember, but she was unable to do so. When at last she fell asleep, this thought still haunted her. She woke suddenly, two hours later, her mind intensely alert, conscious of an agonizing pain such as she had never known before. The thorn in her heart was throbbing and aching in a manner she could scarcely bear. It was though, and if you weren't here with us, the thorn in her heart is the seed of love that was planted there. It was as though the pain was hammering out something which, at first, she was still too confused to be able to understand. Then, all of a sudden, in a terrible flash, it became clear to her, and she found herself whispering over and over again, The shepherd came and called me, as he promised, but I didn't go to him or give any answer. Suppose he thought I had changed my mind and didn't want to go with him. Suppose he has gone and left me behind, gone without me, left me behind. The shock of this thought was awful. This was the thing she had forgotten. He would not be able to understand why she had not gone out to him as he had told her. 
he had urged her to be ready to go with him the instant that he called, that there must be no delay, that he himself had to go to the mountains on urgent business. She had not even been able to go to the trysting place as usual that evening. Of course, he would think she was afraid. Perhaps he was already gone and alone. Much afraid turned icy cold and her teeth chattered, but it was the pain in her heart which caused the most awful part of her distress. It seemed to suffocate her as she lay there in bed. She sat up, shivering with cold and the horror of the thought. She could not bear it if he had gone and left her behind. On the table beside her lay the old songbook, glancing down at it in the light of the lamp. It, she saw that it was open, at the page whereon was written a song about another shepherdess. She, just like herself, had failed to respond to the call of love, and then found too late that love had gone away. It had always seemed to her such a sad song that she could hardly read it, but now as she read the words again, in the dark loneliness of the night, it seemed as though it was the cry of her own forlorn and terrified heart. By night on my bed I sought him, he whom my soul loveth so. I sought, but I could not find him, and now I will rise and go out in the streets of the city and out in the broad highway. For he whom my soul so loveth hath left me and gone away. The page in the little songbook ended there, and she did not turn the leaf. Suddenly she could bear the uncertainty no longer. She must see for herself at once if he really had gone away and left her behind. She slipped out of bed, dressed herself as quickly as her shaking fingers would permit, and then unlocked the cottage door. She, too, would go out into the street and the broad highway and see if she could find him, to see if he had gone and left her behind, or, oh, if only it were possible, if he had waited to give her another chance. Opening the door, she went out into the darkness. A hundred craven fears lurking in the lonely street could not have deterred her at that moment for the pain in her heart swallowed up fear and everything else and drove her forward. So in the dark hours, just before the dawn, much afraid, started off to look for the shepherd. And tomorrow we'll see what she found. So often, when we are in the control of fear, when we are dealing with trauma responses, freezing, fawning, fleeing, we are unable to connect with, connect deeply with what we long for most, and that is love. All of these other things tend to get in the way between us and what we truly want. And until we learn that love is stronger than our fear, that God has given us no fear, but love and power and a clear mind. Until we learn how to access that, until we practice telling ourselves the truth about our fears, that love is stronger and live in that mindset, we will often continue to be frozen by fear. We will have that same trauma response. We will have that same dysregulation. And of course, there are practical things we can do with our bodies and our breathing and trauma therapies. And excuse me, I'm not getting enough oxygen this morning. There are so many things that we can do. But until we focus on learning to do those things and seeking that out, we will continue to stay locked in that cycle of being frozen in fear. I know for me, when my life was no longer ruled by fear, it was beautiful. When I realized that love was stronger than fear and the things that I, were mo I was most afraid of, many times, were things that could be changed. Things that didn't have to have that grip and that hold on me forever. So if you are stumbling through your healing, after abuse, trauma, if you're stumbling through post-separation abuse now, maybe you've gotten safe, but you're not stable and you're trying to get strong. You're just not there yet. I would love for you to come join me 
in my monthly coaching club called The Scoop, where we work through things that get in the way of letting us live a life without fear. I'll drop the link below. And if you liked this story today, if you enjoyed the lessons, share it with a friend, tag a friend underneath. I would love to hear your thoughts.